not all photos might make a good video and not all videos might make a good photo. Episode 176. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with architect and architectural photographer, Chris Hopkinson. So Chris is an ARB certified architect. He's based in London. And as a result of his architectural education, he has developed a very unique eye and photographic approach. And it was really interesting speaking with Chris. We first met in Lisbon um, and we've spoken before. Chris has been a listener of the podcast and it's been really amazing hearing Chris's transition from being working in an architectural practice in an office and moving over to becoming a photographer. Um, Chris has worked with some extraordinary clients. He's worked with Stanton Williams, Studio E. Gray West. He's worked with the Peabody's Coffee, Marcini Curran, as well as a host of other top tier architects. And in this conversation, Chris and I discuss the importance of architectural photography, how to get the best out of your photographer and how to use your architectural photography as an essential piece of marketing collateral. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Chris Hopkinson. Hello, Enix Sears here with a special announcement for you, our diehard podcast fan. Listen on for a life-changing opportunity for the right person. I have a question for you. Did you know that Ryan Willard, who's currently our Director of Education and Consulting here at Business of Architecture, started out listening to the podcast? Well, we here at Business of Architecture, we're looking for a new team member. And I have a feeling that our next team member currently listens to the Business of Architecture podcast. Perhaps you enjoy architecture, but something tells you that it isn't right for you or you're looking for another opportunity. In any case, we're currently hiring a detail-oriented, enthusiastic person to be the glue that holds our team together by managing internal project deadlines and communication. If you or someone you know is a spreadsheet wizard, thrives on lists and deadlines, and knows how to organize and influence a team, and you want to learn and grow professionally as well as personally, you could be our next project manager. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash PM position to find out more. Once again, that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash PM position without spaces to find out more. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Chris, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. My pleasure. So a bit of a different scene from last time we met in the beautiful sunshine in a coffee shop in, in Lisbon. It is a little we're bit more. Our, yeah, we're both in our, exactly, both back in our home offices here. So you are an architect who has made the transition into the world of architectural photography. Um, and you're working closely with architects in helping them capture their built and completed work predominantly um, f- for f- photographic purposes, helping them build portfolio of the visual library, if you like, of their of their work, which then gets used in all sorts of different marketing collateral. And it really is the front face or the shop window yeah. into an architecture practice. So something that you know, I think many architects, they get the importance of architectural photography and it might be an aspirational thing, but it's something that often gets negated. And, you know, we, we can go onto plenty of architectural websites where somebody's taken, you know, if they've done the pictures themselves or worst case scenario, this doesn't happen that often with a, with a decent practice. They're using iPhone pictures or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so why don't we start off by what, what had you move and become an architectural photographer was this something that you were always interested in um yeah well so i mean it it actually only started because of architecture in uh, mm-hmm. in first year we got told to have all these things the drawing board the technical pencils um and one of the things was a camera so that if we did site visits or made models then we could document those and use those at a later date and then sort of while we were 
you know, going on field trips and also going on just personal holidays. Uh, yeah, it just seemed like a nice thing to to have. And so I got a slightly better one after a few years and then mm-hmm. another slightly better one. And then I lived in uh, in China for a while. Um, and yeah, it was one of the things that I really enjoyed when I was there was uh, cycling around the city and taking photos of what was going on. Uh, and then I slowly started, uh, like, in part two, I took a few photos for one of my tutor's husband's projects, uh, a few of those. Uh, yeah, and that must have been in 2011 or so. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just slowly, slowly built from there and just uh, just found an interest in, well, all, all architects, I think, have an aesthetic interest in uh, in projects, but just more so than most, I guess. And and does your work predominantly only deal with complete work, or do you are you involved in like the kind of build process, or are you invil- involved with even the design process of a project in terms of producing photographic output? Um, I don't know about design, but I could guess it depends how you look at it. Uh, producing media, um, so I was on site uh, in the Olympic Park a few months ago, um, taking some photos of one of the buildings that's it was probably about six months away from completion. Right. But just, um, you know, capturing some of the life on site, uh, some of, you know, bits, bits of the building, how they fit together. And, uh, I guess telling the story of how, how they're coming together and then a bit of the activity around the site and also near the site, you know, with people beginning to get used to the project in its, in its new context. And when you're working with an architectural client, how do you begin to develop a brief with them? What are some of the, how, how does the commissioning process work? And how do you kind of help prepare an architect to get the best out of you? Um, I think that's still something I'm learning myself as well. Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, ju- just the same as, as an architect would with a client, just sort of, so they they can tell me what they're after, and I can suggest what kind of form that might take. So whether it's either a half day or a full day or a, a series of mm-hmm. visits, um, and then ideally getting some information before before the project started. Uh, so to see you know what what direction everything's pointing to try and get started to think about the light, um, looking at the weather. Uh, finding an appropriate date for access and all, all things like that. And then uh, also ideally getting either the architect or someone who has been involved with the design um, on site on the day. So then they know the project a lot better than me mm-hmm. uh, and can help help direct things. And then we can collaborate on the day with, uh, with getting the best out of it. Is it a case of... Um... Does it work well if, say, an architect just phones you up and says, here's the building, here's the address, off you go, take some photographs? Or does it require more planning and perhaps you understanding, like, the, the kind of underpinning narrative behind the building and its context to so that you've got a, more a photographic story that you can tell? Yeah, I, that certainly helps. Um, and I have had one or two projects where, where I haven't, known a lot about the building going in and the architect hasn't been there and mm-hmm. yeah occasionally they might not lead to exactly the right, right outcome because you know as with everything without as much information and input then you're sort of guessing some of the stuff as it goes along um yeah as, as with architects like if if you got told by a client design this building and then you you didn't really hear from them for another few months then um that might bring up issues in in your design you, you're sort of going blind a little bit and just go with your best instincts yeah so why is it important then that architects use a photographer to properly capture their work and is there a is there a, a scale where you think it's not appropriate or do you think this is something that actually architects of all scope and sizes should be utilizing um, investing in I guess in an ideal world, then you would, everyone, including myself, would want to spend a certain percentage, uh, I think is recommended sort of five, five to 10 or 15% of your income 
as far as marketing yourself. Mm -hmm. And so photography fits very much into the marketing bracket. Um, so yeah, where possible, you should be be trying to include that in, in your spending for the year and in your overheads. Um, it's not always possible on every single thing. And, you know, if you're doing a very, very small project and mm -hmm. you might have lost money on it as architects somehow managed to do, uh, then it then it's quite it becomes quite hard to justify spending more money onto something. But if you're doing something that you're pleased with and you've obviously spent, whether it's weeks, months, years working on, then it, it sort of makes sense to spend a bit of money and time making sure that you've got some good good output for that for your website for social media for for future clients to see what does i mean i mean we're living in a a time now where the demands say from publications for you know from from designs and from the architectural digests and all these sorts of um magazines <clears throat> they've set the bar extremely high in terms of what is required for an architect and for the for the photography mm -hmm. to be able to even be considered to be published and i think that's kind of part and parcel of the of the of the game um what what would you suggest to or say to architects when they're kind of looking at their work to get to get published of how they should be approaching work with a photographer where can architectural photography be used i suppose it could be used wherever you're trying to promote your business um Mm -hmm. whatever avenue that might be. So like some, I guess the very biggest practices will use a mixture of print and website and social media. Um, smaller practices might just stick to social media and LinkedIn and um, other things like that to get to their, their clients. And uh, I guess small to medium ones might produce some sort of brochures just for their personal use have around the office um mm -hmm. to show to new clients got it and and if you're producing photography does it help you to know where the photographs are going to be used and does that change the kind of brief or or is actually a photographic set quite versatile in how you can use it um i think you can you can try and tailor so like for example uh for going into magazines and things like if you're doing a kitchen that want that wants to go into a magazine then there's the thought of trying to leave spaces for where the text can go alongside things uh and sort of trying to make make stuff balanced in a different way rather than just like filling a scene or just to capture to capture the image in its best light sort of with an eye on what it's going to be used for um yeah so i think it's definitely worth bearing in mind if it's known at an early stage, what, what different photography is going to be used for. Um, and also a little bit sort of stylistically. So some of the magazines uh, promote quite a natural look and don't have any artificial lights and it's just whatever lights available and you work with that. Um, oh, right. So, so different magazines have got different looks and it's worth knowing what the kind of trend is with the certain public. Can you give us an example? What, what magazines like what? Um, if you if I, I've not not got a significant library so far. Um, I think someone mentioned the other week uh, Enki, I think is a magazine, right. uh, and yeah. I believe that they're sort of quite uh, a bit like the modern house, um, sort of quite into natural light and so just having the lights turned off uh, for the vast majority and just have nice mm -hmm. soft daylight coming in and not necessarily everything very well lit, which you can do with artificial lights to sort of punch punch in different parts and. Kind, yep. kind of HDR, but it's a bit more sophisticated than that. Um, right. Yeah, and then there's other other ones. I can't think of an example, but yeah, sort of quite like everything nice and balanced and well exposed overall, rather than just uh, have some parts exposed correctly. Got it. Okay, so, so it, the more that an architect knows where the photography is going to be used or where it's going to live actually can influence how you might approach the shoot i think so and and also to help with the the search for the photographer who's appropriate to them um or at least for that job um 
yeah, so if they find someone who has a lot of experience with that kind of thing or if that's sort of uh, in their stylistic wheelhouse, mm -hmm. then they can, yeah, approach them and that might be an easier easier way than, than just sticking with the one photographer for everything and trying to trying to bend either their wants or skills. But yeah, I mean, as much as people are also uh, adaptable. What, what, what are your thoughts on kind of maintaining and working with the same photographer over long periods of time? Because this is often, you know, quite an interesting thing. Obviously, different photographers have got different styles and there are kind of different ways of looking at it. Is there a lot of benefit in maintaining a long-term relationship with a photographer? Or does it work to kind of chop and change things depending on what the brief is? Um, I think I'm probably biased with this and... Uh... <laughs> Try somebody yeah, new. Yeah, well, yeah. Obviously, as a as a relatively new photographer, full time in the arena, um, yeah, it is tricky because some practices are quite tied to the one photographer, which is obviously mm -hmm. from a business perspective what that's where you want to get to with with anything. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it's quite nice with some some practices sort of chop and change, and it's as much as you might not have say on the homepage or Instagram page, everything might not be exactly the same style or quite quite be as cohesive. Um, it, it might sort of make it a bit more interesting and I guess it's a bit like architects when, when some architects have a house style where you can see, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a Zaha Hadid and it's kind of nice to mix things up and have have not just a house style, but be adaptable to the different scenarios and different projects that they take on. Do you get involved in dressing the properties? So, for example, if you're working with a residential mm. um, architect and they've got residential clients, do you ever involved in kind of art direction on the inside of the property, or do you or do you advise architects to kind of take control of that so that when you arrive on site, it's not filled with children's toys normally that's the thing that uh, <laughs> can ruin any architectural photo, photo shoot yeah I'm sure. um i would say I, or I'm not quite or hands off with the dressing part because it's kind of a secondary part to the job and and that's a whole that's a whole job in itself uh for some mm -hmm. bigger practices or interior designers uh they would yeah. employ someone to go along with the uh, photographer to dress the scenes for them um, mm -hmm. I would say cleaning windows is uh, is quite a good thing that the architects can make sure it's done before shoots. That's quite nice. Um, but as far as like kids toys and things, personally, I think that spaces can can look quite nice knowing that there's people having been lived in them, um, rather than just if it's you know you go into a kitchen and there's a fruit bowl on the side and that's Absolutely, it. it's kind of, kind of nice sometimes where you know there's if there's some fridge magnets or a few semi curated kids' toys around. Um, yeah, you don't want stuff all over the floor, but yeah, some bits quite nice. Lego strewn across the yeah. place, fridge magnet. Well, what? yeah, it just just a bit of yeah. color because some, um, you know, some, yeah, some a lot of the styles that we have now are quite quite bland as you can see by my rented room here quite a bit nice beige affair well i think that that's quite interesting is how much evidence do you have that people are living in or using the space in the photography and obviously we've come from a, a kind of modernist background where the trend in architectural photography for a long time has been just remove activity remove human beings and have it a kind of pure abstracted form are we seeing a kind of shift and a trend move away from that and is this also something that the magazines are moving towards because again it makes a lot of sense if the magazines are kind of if they're wanting to see people then obviously there's a real you know we want to be playing into the hands of like the people who are going to be publishing the photographs as well so are we seeing a kind of a trend moving away in that direction um i would say possibly broadly uh i i can't I can't actually think as to whether magazines are going more or less in that direction. Um, but I think it's quite nice sort of 
you know, whether it's just like having the blur, of, like I was just edit, editing photos this morning and I got the person who was helping me dress the house the other day uh, to just like, you know, walk up and down the stairs and things like that to get the, the, the old foot, foot blur going on. Um, yeah. And that's kind of why I've uh, also started going into video over the last few months a little bit um, to right. to try and not just capture the architecture by itself, but some of the life around it. So with moving images, you can obviously get quite a lot more, even if it's just a, just a still camera or just a slowly moving camera, but obviously the still building, it sort of brings a bit more life into things. Yeah. And how does um, the video shoot differ from your photographic shoots? Is this a set? Is this a complete separate thing or will you often do both at the same time? Um, Sometimes, yeah, depending on the time frame, sort of both at the same time. Um, and then just sort of making at the moment, just like sort of one to three minute or so videos of it. Um, so basically setting up, setting up photos and then taking a few photos as I normally would and then uh, just taking the video alongside it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, yeah, as I said, it yeah it just makes a bit more of a dynamic thing. And um, I did. I was reading a thing from uh, uh, Jim Stevenson the other day, and he was sort of talking about how not something I thought about that with photographs, um, you edit them and you might hand them to the client, kind of with a considered order that that you might have in mind to tell the story of the building, and then they can change that. And then if it goes into a magazine, then they can change what the architects had in mind. But with the video, if if the client's happy with what I'm producing, then that's that's the order that the shots stay in. Which, yeah, I thought was quite an interesting, interesting thought. Yeah, and I, I guess you've got, there's numerous different ways of approaching video. One is, you know, kind of a collection of B-roll footage, which can then be used and re-edited re and mm -hmm. repurposed at will from the architect yeah. or yeah. by you if you like you could you could do lots of different edits um and i guess video footage becomes incredibly versatile because we can see it being used on a website on social media as a f independent standalone film yeah. itself and it's got a lot of it's got a lot of mileage are you seeing that typically architects when they're commissioning you to do a photographic set that the video just becomes part and parcel of that or is it normally people come to you with a very specific video idea in mind um i've not uh, i've not produced too many for architects so far um i did do one the other week where it was it was quite a last minute thing and that was it was part of an entry for a design award actually um mm -hmm. so they wanted you know, uh, 15 photos and then uh, I think it was either a minute or two video to go along with the submission. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was just both at once. And yeah, so it's essentially just taking taking both similarly alongside. It's it's a little bit more to organise because um, it's obviously another thing to think about and not all, not all photos might make a good video and not all videos might make a good photo. Uh, so it's not just... Right shot for shot kind of thing um yeah so I, I think it depends on the client and what they're what they're after really um in terms of the the difference between commercial just to sort of change tact mm. a little bit here um you know when you're photograph, i know you you photograph both a lot of residential work and you've been working with commercial properties um as 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 well what are some of the differences there in terms of your preparation and how you often advise an architect client to prepare? It, it sort of depends on what kind of, yeah, well, obviously it depends on what kind of building it is. Uh, but, but in terms of yeah. what the, what the people inside the building are doing, you know, whether it's a, whether it's been worked in or lived in, whether it's actually, just being completed in his bed so far um mm -hmm. that that yeah obviously feeds into what what the outcome is going to be from the from the projects um i'm not really sure specifically what what differences are between those um i i guess there's different permissions and things from from the 
from whoever's using the building, sort of if it's big commercial things as like I did a data center and it was like, you know, you're only allowed in these very certain areas and this and all the shots have to be have to go through security checks before anything goes through. Um, which obviously yep. makes it a lot more complicated. Um yeah, and, that, and I think that also photography and video, I think video is more susceptible to having more checks and things than, than photos. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, I, yeah, I guess, yeah, just with the security, again, uh, you know, even when you're, you've are you been uh, asked to do photography around some buildings and the, <laughs> there was one in the background, um in East London that had a huge, huge orange sign of the building next door sort of advertising essentially what the building is. And security guy came along and asked me uh, if I was taking photos of that, that building. I was like, no, it's just, just, just the one next door. He's like, Are there, is the sign in it? Like, yes. Yeah, a big orange sign. But yeah. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah. It's. What? So, 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 what are what are some of the rules and laws that people need to be aware of in this in this case? I, if it's in the public domain, like yeah, but but it's um, it? well, yeah, a completely different topic and a a different podcast maybe with uh, different different guests as well. But um, <laughs> as far as public and private realm, uh, so like for example, the Olympic Park, it's not a public park. And it, if you want to go and take photos in there with the tripod, you need to pay about nine hundred pound a day to go and do so. I have been stopped. By, I've actually been stopped in the Olympic Park taking pictures before yeah, with the tripod. And I had security guards called on me, and I was like, "Oh, it was just." And it, so it's not. So so okay. So so, but I mean, I, I guess if you're working with an architect um, and their client is the building owner, there were there's less likely to be these kinds of issues and it's only it's only really a, a potential issue when it's when we're talking about neighboring buildings and people and buildings that are not in not yeah. in the in the same location basically that end up being being part yeah, of yeah yeah exactly yeah. what are some of the mistakes that you'll often see made with architectural photography so maybe in a in the context of a website F from photographers themselves from either from photographers and from architects, um, I, I mean, I guess I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know if I want to say too much about photographers. Um, <laughs> architects, I guess. Well, yeah, you know, like I've heard about some architects hiring photographers for their shoots, but not architectural photographers. Um, so they might do a great headshot, but it's both having the knowledge and the kit is different to different to yeah. doing architecture photography um and like different uh a different mindset and i guess that they wouldn't think about you know to, to trying to keep the vertical straight which is a very architectural thing that you're seeing almost all magazines and things and uh websites you want the vertical straight and yeah. that's like a basic one-on-one -on -one thing um and I get, I guess, well, it's, e it's easy for me to say because this is my business, but I think as as with before, like the same goes for architects when they're bidding for work. Um, that's frustrating when when the architects choose someone just mm -hmm. because of their price. But the same with architects, if you choose and contractors, if you choose the one who charges less, then quite often the quality is going to suffer with that. Um, there's probably a reason why they're charging less and that might be kind of apparent sooner or later yep. um yeah for whatever reason so it's yeah if if the main priority is just about money then choose the cheapest but if it's about quality and reliability uh and building relationship then uh yeah then there's more important things at play um what does a successful commission look like from your perspective when you've done a great job you're really pleased with the with the with the photograph with the shoot. What what sorts of things have been have worked well? What sorts of things were in mm -hmm. place, and how do you how can you tell from the photographs? I guess with a couple of them, uh, I got an opportunity to go back a few times. Like I, there's again a, a different project in East London, um, 
I got, uh, I think I got three afternoons all together to go, go and take photos there. So as much as you can try your best with things like the weather, you can't, you can't guarantee anything in England, seemingly. Um, I think on one of the days, it's, it, the, the site was like an hour away and I set off, we, did, we decided that morning, yeah, let's do it today. It's looking sunny, set off in the sun here, went through torrential rain to get there and then it was sunny later in the afternoon luckily um but yeah you can't always guarantee what's going to happen with the weather so if you as much as photographers can be flexible then uh, the more time you get to do a project then um the more chance of of it being good conditions and good as far as what people are doing on the site um what you know you might get a trade vehicle that's parked up uh on a site for the afternoon <laughs> and that depending on what you can do scuppers scupper some of the lovely externals um yeah I, I guess just having time and being able to plan things well um as with everything it's trickier the the more short notice everything is um so planning things getting as much information as you can do beforehand um being clear on what the priorities are in terms of the most important things that you want to get photographed um because obviously i i can take we can take a good guess at that but uh but without knowing the client's intent or if they're there on the day then uh it well, what happens quite hard. if you rock up onto the site and you know number one it suddenly starts pissing down with rain and kind of ruins all the light and you know and then and then you've got builders coming in they're causing they're parking all over the place and do you just have to re abandon the shoot and then and then reschedule it how does it how does it work with the with the relationship with the client when that kind of stuff happens i guess it depends how deep the client's pockets are because uh, i've luckily not had quite that bad yeah. um it, you know it would be a case for either let's call it let's call it this amount for today and we'll mm -hmm. just do it another day uh or uh you know personally more more often it's been um it's not ideal weather today but you know let's make sure we get this and yeah if there's builds in the way then let's do a nice portrait shot of the building instead of a landscape yeah. one um and you know, a cloudy sky can be quite quite nice and moody. You get some nice reflections off the off the rain puddles. Not always bad. Do you like to visit a building more than once? So, um, will you will you do like a kind of uh, a, a a research trip to a project, and then maybe you'll photograph it once in the summer, and then photograph the same project again in the winter? Um, I'd love to do that. On, often on a lot of shoots, the the budget doesn't really right. stretch to that. Um, so again, it it depends on how much how much the client wants to spend on this and how much time they want to allot um, for a photographer yep. to do this. Um, so obviously, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same fee to go for a recce day, um, but it, it is someone's time and time and effort to go there, um, which I. Yeah, I think it is very useful if there's a possibility to do that. Um, you get to learn a bit about the site and uh, see where the light falls on different days. Um, and plan your time a bit more effectively when you're doing that. Because, you know, as much as you can plan before getting there, like looking at plans and elevations, once you get to a site, then it's all systems go and, uh, you know, let let's that shot looks good in this light let's start there and uh get on with the day in that way i, I guess w one thing i was always interested in is when a client hires you to take photographs of the building mm. what is the usage in terms of your copyright and the license for the client to be able to use the the pictures are, are architects allowed to use your pictures freely wherever they want are they allowed to say give them to consultants and say here you go here's the photographs we've taken of the picture you can use these pictures on your on your websites is that allowed or how does the how do the licenses and the contracts work with who yeah um yeah so it's been a learning curve the last year for, for sort of what's what's the done thing in the industry um 
it's sort of the, the usual thing is, um, so I'll go and take the photos for, say, the architect. And if, when we're negotiating the contract for that, um, they say that uh, we'd also like the contractor to, to use the photos mm-hmm. as well, um, then it's sort of quite ordinary to to add on a percentage for the shared cost of that. So it becomes you know cheaper for the architect, but then the, the contractor will be sharing some of the yeah. costs of that. Um, and so both of them would be able to use them and say, you know, if one party takes over the choosing of which photos it is rather than trying to negotiate between mm-hmm. three ways. Um, and then once the shoot's done, they, they would have, well, I, th- I think some people still may try and charge year to year for use of the, the photo contracts, uh, the licenses, sorry. Um, but I sort of, yeah, just grant perpetuity for website, social media, uh, any brochures and things, uh, any magazines. And then I think the only stipulation is sort of if it's for any, um, like a printed book for sale, you know, like a proper hardback that's going to go into a bookshop, then uh, then that might be a different conversation. Got it. Okay. So that's quite interesting um, as a, as a uh, potential business model, as an architectural photographer, if you were able to structure your contracts where actually it's a licensing fee that actually lasts for a year as opposed to in perpetuity. And then, then you've got kind of, then you're, then you're creating yeah. kind of assets. You are, but I'm not <laughs> sure if a lot of clients work. Well, the architects licenses go, no way. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I, especially since I think quite a lot of photographers just do yeah. it. You have these ones for for as long as you need them. Um, but then, yeah, like you said, sort of after the shoot, um, if if then the the window manufacturer comes to you and says we'd like to use these as well, then then there would be a you would sell a, a license to them personally, and that would be not involve the architect or Got anyone else. We mentioned earlier about the sort of mistakes that you, you might see happen when hiring an architectural photographer or hiring a photographer. And one of them is using a, the wrong kind of photographer. And I've, <clears throat> I've done that before in the past seemed so obvious mm. after the fact when you're like, well, that was really, that was really daft. Um, what, you know, we often see a lot of architects, they'll use, their own they know that they, they'll do the photography themselves um i've often yeah. when, when looking at lots of different architects websites you start to recognize which photographs are done by professionals and which ones are not and it and it can stand yeah. out even when it's an architect who's who's a good photographer they're often not at the same level of as a architectural photographer and the photographs um end up end up standing out and obviously you know it can be an easy choice. Oh, this guy or my, you know, my niece, she's doing photography a level now and let's have her take photographs and that will, Mm. that will do. What are some of the, you know, why is it bad to do that? Yeah. I mean, good, good and bad is hard to label already. Um, it's obviously as with anything, if you can afford to hire a, an expert, then then that's what you should ideally yeah. do. Um, I don't think that phone photography is, yeah, it's not a bad thing. It's just, yeah, like you said, you can see, you know, when they put things on the website, especially when it's quite big, and you can see the quality difference to the to the mm. proper things. But I mean, I I do take quite a lot of photos on my phone. Uh, it's just a Pixel Five and you know, just give them a quick edit on my phone and uh, put them on my Instagram and quite a few other photographers like, wow, you, you, you took these on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> but sort of, you do, as a photographer, uh, hesitate sometimes because you don't, that, I suppose in a similar way to architects putting less perfect images on their website, I, I hesitate sometimes putting phone photos on my Instagram because then people might think that's the best work that I'm doing rather than just work that I'm, you know, that's, that's the camera that I have with me, which is, uh, you know, that's all you can use to capture things really. What, where do you think the real value of architectural photography is? I was thinking about this and I I think it's 
being able to share spaces with a person or people who who they can't can't or haven't been mm. to that place. So for example, I don't know if you've ever been to uh, to Falling Water by Frank no, right? Oh yeah, but you know, know what it looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I've also never been, and I know what it looks like. And so if if there weren't any photos or any good photos of that, then I guess tens of thousands of architects wouldn't know what it mm -hmm. looks like. So I suppose that that's part of the value of it, sort of being able to share things. I mean, it, these days, obviously, across the world, um, with anyone who chooses to look at it. Um, yeah, and it, you're not going to... The best architect in the world with the richest client, with the best contractor, if they if they create a building, then unless it's a public building, then I'm not going to see it, you're not going to mm -hmm. see it, the next client's not going to see it unless there's good photos yep. of it. Um, so I get, I get, yeah, I guess in simplistic terms, and that's... That's why, and uh, I guess I, I, you know if if that is the case with the with a great client and producing a lovely building, uh, then it's worth spending the money on on good yeah, photos. And, to do and, I, and I guess really with that with that kind of quite simple definition of what it is, it's the, the photograph is the way that a building gets shared ultimately because there isn't yeah. another one. I mean, you obviously you can go and visit it and see it, but the majority of people are not ever going to go and see. And you know, architecture is confined by the obvious location constraint, right? Mm -hmm. You can't have buildings moving and walking around and that the photographic medium is the okay. only way really to share what, you know, we don't take, we don't take audio samples of buildings really and share those. That's not of any interest. The visual yeah. photograph is the main way that a building gets um, publicized. Therefore we start to see a massive importance in architecture where the photographic work is the, it is the window into a practice, certainly the work. Hmm. Um, and so yeah. getting it right is a, is a big investment. Getting it wrong, then we end up unintentionally communicating all the sort of wrong things about our, our work. And you yeah. can kind of reduce a, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of work in a finished product um, with, a, with a, f a few poorly placed photographs or not done, mm -hmm. not done well. And the project is kind of reduced in, in value or people are making their mind up about you and their project instantaneously based on a photograph. Yeah. Yeah. A lot can, a lot can happen based on a yeah. picture, which, which, um, which, is, which is kind of mad. Cause then we start to see how really, uh, important it is to have good good photographs and obviously even in terms of just getting published nowadays magazines have such a high standard of what they're going to accept that if you're even thinking about getting your mag your work published on a on a kind of external platform other than your instagram account or your website then it needs to meet this sort of um professional standards of of, of criteria and, and as you were saying there are even magazines even have their own kind of subtle branding agendas to make sure that as you're flipping mm. through the, the books that the photographs have got some sort of coalescence to them or some sort of coherence to them, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, also just bringing into mind now, um, I guess like the most, most ridiculed architecture in the last year was probably the Marble Arch Mound, which probably if you, if you hadn't seen any photos that just, people had taken or you know that that were from things taking the mick out of it then uh i'm sure that if if a good photographer was asked to go and take photos of it for the architect i bet they could have done <laughs> as 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 uh unsatisfactory as the end result was if if you're trying to you can frame a lot with with photography that's not necessarily the whole yes truth. yeah well that's that's again that's very interesting it's like photography can actually be a bit of a savior here and you know potential mm. aversion to a pr disaster um the, yeah. i was always amazed when i went and visited the um, thermal baths in vows the peter simther building at how yeah. it wasn't like the photographs and i mean it's an extraordinary building 
but there were there are kind mm. of a few money shots that we always see on the front pages of of the of the magazines and the monographs of and and I always imagine mm. the building to be in this kind of isolated place just on this you know empty mountainside with beautiful snow and that the building was just kind of looking out and it's not it's really crowded and and then no, that's and there's like you know there's like a the hotel another part of the hotel right next door to it and and then there's mm. bits as you're walking up to the to the to the museum or to the to the baths where you can actually put your hand like that and you're like oh yeah there's that there's that shot <laughs> there, there's the shot yeah and it's well that's disappointing i'll postpone my trip <laughs> well it well, it becomes interesting because it because a building like that the photography has been so uh instrumental in making it such an iconic building yeah and same with same as you say with the uh, with falling water it's the it's the images that have been the thing that has spread the spread the design if you like it's not drawings that we're looking at particularly yeah yeah um but also sort of you were talking about um not everyone can can go to a place to visit a thing but also not everyone can go to a time to visit some things so like photographs they capture things just at that moment so yeah i was having a look in in, pre in uh, preparation for this and uh you know things like uh things like the photos of the eiffel tower when it was being constructed like that just seeing it sort of with just the base and then you know going up to a third of the way half the way very fascinating photos but they're sort of fascinating because they'll never it'll never be like that again yes. um sort of similarly with i think i was reading it was staged though the um the new york uh like scaffolders you know when they're sat on that big big beam having lunch yeah. uh such an iconic photo um which yeah i discovered i think wasn't real real um but yeah just Wait, just the story moment in time they, that, they um, in, don't tell me they were in a studio i know i don't think in a studio i think it was it was all there it's, it's but it cropped wasn't in a just... way that makes it look really precarious mm. what I, yeah it might have been precarious but i i was at least reading a few things that were suggesting that it was a proper photographer and that the people who were doing it weren't necessarily the people who were just just happened to be having lunch sat on the big bean well that, again that that becomes quite interesting when considering to take photographs of your of a project and and do a film is you know where is the line between theater and invention and you know capturing it in reality so those kind of iconic photographs that you know there might have been a bit of a bit of staging with them and you know maybe they mm. weren't even real workers who got placed up there they were acrobats or whatever you know maybe that's taking it a step far but where where is your view on the on that line of kind of the theater of architectural photography and authenticity um i haven't really considered much about the theater but um i guess authenticity sort of like I hope it's not laziness as far as like photoshopping and things like that, but I, I quite like to try to keep the vast majority of things sort of as they are. You know, obviously it's photoshopping out the old smoke alarm or things like that, but I think for the vast majority, sort of trying to keep things quite quite honest, mm -hmm. um, which I think is the architect in me. You know, when when you're designing buildings, you don't want to to be hiding too much you want the building to be to look as it is kind of thing so without having you know a steel inside and then like a lovely wooden outside that i feel that's a bit of a a lie with what's actually going yeah. on um yeah so similar with photography like like you were saying at the baths like you want to you want to go to the place and not be struck by by what's different in in the photographs to actually experiencing it um which i guess also in it's harder to do in uh films you can't really unless you're very skilled fake things much it, it, it is what it is but you're i guess you're concentrating more on the experience rather than just the just analyzing the one image mm. what, what do you th think of the, the sort of trend that we've seen a little bit of 
where there are kind of deliberate scenes set up inside of the building. I mean, I remember viewing on Dazine a little while back, there was an architect who had done a series of photographs in one of the houses and they had done the kind of the, the, the preparation before the party, during the party and after the party. And they were a bit, they were interesting. They were very interesting. And they had the kind mm. of, um, you know, the kind of aftermath of the party with people lying around the floors. And, but it was all very staged. Um, what, what, yeah. are, what are your, some of your thoughts on that? Again, it's kind of moving into, the, into a, a theatre, if you like. And, 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 how do you, uh, and how do you kind of help direct a, an architect with what needs to be set up in a space? I haven't done too much directing so far. <laughs> I'm sort of quite, yeah, like have an opinion of things. Uh, sort of, you know, as I said, like it, it's, it's nice to have a, elements of life um, and the old chair pulled out and cup here and there. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't done anything with party or there's like another. I've no idea who who actually took the photos, but uh, there's like one a few years ago where there was like a horse either in or just next. I think yeah, I think a man on a horse inside like a big country house somewhere, which is quite a. It, yeah, it it sort of goes into almost almost, almost fashion photography kind right. of that that sort of arena um yeah I, all very interesting um maybe i'll do that kind of thing one day um yeah it, it's not the normal shoot for for what i've encountered yeah. um got it and I, and I and i and i guess it's it's very much you know the architect led how they want you know what's their brand of the practice and a more quirky yeah. fashion orientated practice might see it appropriate to have a more editorial style photo shoot from one of their glamorous houses. Whereas yeah. a house of architects that are focused on social housing or something much more sensible and, and practical would have a much more authentic and honest approach to, to revealing the work. Yeah. If you're going to have people involved in it, then, you know, it's actually quite important to capture some of the real life aspects of it. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I think that's definitely a good point. And um, sort of, I, I have suggested to a few architects so far, but not, none have taken me up quite yet. Um, kind of post occupancy photography or film. Um, it's like, it's well, related to, I think that is something that we should be doing more as architects, uh, post occupancy evaluations mm -hmm. to learn better how, how your building is functioning. Uh, both sort of you know mechanically and structurally but as far as how it is to experience it as someone living there yep. um so i think doing those kind of things both formally and either visually or in film um it, it brings a different dimension to the building and uh sort of shows them as i said like not just at the, at the moment in time where they're Oh, the building's complete and it's lovely and polished and perfect. You know, if, if it's done five years or ten years later, then it kind of shows how it's settled into into the environment and into and people have settled into it. So, you know, it, it's a bit like with landscape architecture. Sort of, there's desire lines are made um, rather than just the footpaths. And mm -hmm. people people might have amended things that you've done that you thought this would be really good, and they've they're using things in a different way. Um, I think it's really, really valuable to know again, if there's, if there can be the budget taken into, into account for that, yep. which I feel is probably the reason that a lot of architects don't do it. The sort of, it's not really, it's not a requirement and they don't really have the budget for it. And the client, generally you know if it's a developer they they don't a lot of the time i don't have think have the will to to bother investigating into that because yeah. it's not going to affect them much but it it does with architects and a lot of architects want to go into architecture to make better spaces for people and so knowing how they're performing for them is is a very important part i think brilliant so what have you got planned for the rest of the of 2022 um yeah i guess just carry on 
carry on building uh, relationships with clients. Um, I should probably try and try and take on some personal projects uh, to to catch my interest and uh, keep me going. Um, yeah, see how the winter goes. Excellent. I think. Uh, yeah, darker days, uh, less photos, maybe. <laughs> so making the most of the summer. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, Chris, thank you very much for sharing your insights and advice on what makes great architectural photography. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.